2003, I met William Fairbank after I encountered his film, Head On. I was really impressed with this work because in many years of working in brain injury and research and teaching, I had never encountered anything quite like this. It was a phenomenological examination of what it is really like to experience a brain injury. I thought it had the potential then to be a wonderful training tool for my students, but also, more importantly, for people with brain injury. The question of how do you live after a brain injury is something that is frequently asked by families and people with brain injury and often it's very difficult to give any kind of an answer. After the head-on film, William and I continued a conversation about how to develop these ideas. From this we've de developed this collaboration around the idea of looking at people who are artists with brain injury. We're looking at people who are highly intelligent, with a lot of social and cultural capital behind them, who are able to articulate what the, it's like to live with a brain injury. It's difficult in the first case to describe what any brain state is like, but what they are trying to describe is something that's been damaged and that they've had to adapt to. And we particularly asked people who are artists because we felt that they were people who would be able to articulate that position and I believe that we were right as you will see in this film. One of the things that I really liked about William's work was the fact that he doesn't focus on the accident. It's not a story of a tragedy, it's not a story of something that's been long past. People have to live for decades after their injury. It's particularly important that William is a member of the brain injury community. In the disability studies movement, people have long been saying nothing about us without us. And I think that in the brain injury community, it's been quite difficult to get to that point because you need somebody who is really exceptional, who can actually lead a project. So nothing about us without us. Well, William is leading this project and I'm really happy to be collaborating with him but he can do things in terms of articulating the experience and helping people to articulate it themselves that a researcher without a brain injury could never do. He does this because he shares a culture. What I mean by this is that the people he's interviewing all share a particular perspective on the world. A culture is created in various ways. It can be created because people feel exploited or put upon or in some way they have been grouped together in a different way to the rest of the world. And this is certainly true of people in the brain injury world. They may feel very isolated, but as soon as you put two people with brain injury together, you can see that they share a culture. And the rapport that exists between William and every single person in this film makes it evident just how true that is. William's work is really important because it makes it more accessible. We hope that this will allow it to become a training and a teaching tool. We hope that people will be able to use it to begin to understand what it is like so that when families and people with brain injury are asking the question, how can we, what is our prognosis like, what, how are we going to live, something like this film can be pulled out and some of those answers can be given that there is hope. Hope is really important and hope can only be given from within the culture of brain injury. And now, to start the film, we're going to hear William on Radio New Zealand and then we're going over to England to see him at Lincoln Cathedral. You describe it beautifully in this film work, what living in the present means as a brain injured person. You describe it as being like on a movie set. Yes, the... It's, it, it, my whole life is about communicating to memory people how it is for me and it, it, it's very I'm, it, I'm talking about myself and each person is different but it, it, on the movie set analogy I was thinking we're doing an interview now this is happening I can handle this this is fine right? and that's good but when I go outside I get my car drive off down the road there been absolutely no way that I'll be able to think back onto this interview and sort of mull it over and think, oh, well, you said this and that and the other. No way. You're just driving down the road. You need all your mind just to drive down the road. And so you do one thing at a time, but you haven't got that bigger connection. So this pr living in this present is a whole world. And after the accident, nobody ever really explained to me this new lifestyle 
this new way of living, you know, sort of handy tips and like you're learning a language or something like that. You know, that everything is fantastic at the trauma end, but we are now dealing with, well, I'm 23 years down the line, and that's what I want to make this next film about. So I had my accident back in 1987, and the, um, this work, forestations, was my occupational therapy, and it lasted from 1990 through to 1997. And there are many different ways of interpreting these, interpreting these particular sculptures, and we'll start off with this one, which I, I see as the load which is on your back after brain injury, there's inevitably an accident or some sort of trauma to the brain. And this is the new character, the weight that you have to carry on my shoulders. I mean, I sit here, I've got this headache. Nobody knows. I've got this headache and this sort of rubbish memory and all sorts of things. But I do have abilities too. And so I've made these sculptures. And here I see this one as the, 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 the weight which is there in this new person which I have become since my accident. And this one here is about pressure and all the people coming up behind and you're just under so much pressure and then here and you fall. It's very interesting. And I'd say having these sculptures here in Lincoln Cathedral with all the sounds and all the life going on all around is very good for me. It's very good for me that everybody looks after me and it's just a place in this seen. In a way it's my psychiatric hospital. And then there's the support that you need. After you've had the brain injury you need a lot of support and so I've got three compassionate sculptures and this one here is about your family support. And the, 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 it's just the root, your root support system. As everything else falls away the essence is, is your, your family is there to, to help you, and that's this sculpture. And this one is about support from friends, which is just so important after, after an accident or after a big event. And, and, and you've got your family like that, and then here you've got your, your friends. In, in the film it says, he has his arm around Jesus, he has his arm around the man he loves. And then the third compassionate sculpture is about strangers and how one, one suddenly in a world where one is receiving care all the time, but often it's from strangers, it's from the medicos, it's from people who, who help you in your life. And I've experienced that over and over again over the last 23 years since my accident. Here, I want to show what's going on inside your own mind. It's another sort of pressure. It's an internal pressure, which is just so strong and, and, and nobody else can see it. You hold it personally inside yourself. And he falls, this is to illustrate, is he falls here. And this is all what's going on inside his mind, these, these figures. And there's nobody behind him. You're absolutely on your own. You're very isolated in this post brain bash brain state and a lot of the early stages of living with with a brain injury is coming to terms with these different pressures which one is under and this is a third sort when uh, when when one's alone say one's in one's bed and one's your eyes are shut and yet you're still under this mighty pressure what will crack you and push you over the top might be a door banging or a curtain blowing, but actually you are totally, totally alone. Most of my friends and colleagues who, who've got brain bash states have known some really dark moments. And this is a sculpture to illustrate that. Isolation. Isolation is such a big deal. And I, I wanted to, to, to show how we are holding on to the world, but actually we're set from it. And even when we're, when we're within a group of brain injury people together, we actually continue to feel 
alone. I do, because it's kind of, um, you know, you're trapped in your own world and aren't you? And it's very lonely, because my mum suffered with a brain injury herself from an accident. I grew up with that, so I know exactly what you're talking about here. And how, so it's now that you tell me about all the brain, it's become more personal now. I can look at it with a new perspective as well, you know, more than just the story of Jesus. Within brain injury, the acceptance is such a big deal. And um, um, one of the things which one, me, has to accept is that the old William has actually gone, has finished. I've got to come to terms with the fact that I've got this new mind and the old me has actually died. And I accept that I've got to introduce myself and get to like, which is a bit of a deal, the new person. So if the old person pre-brain bash has died, they're laid, then laid into the tomb. And if it's hard enough for people around you to accept that fact, it's even harder for us, us guys, in that world. We have to come to terms with this fact. And so, a sculpture just on acceptance. This is the way forward. This is the first day of the rest of our lives. And so now I will move forward and I'll introduce each of the other five artists who we're going to have on the film from uh, my own place, Whitegate Sculpture Park, near Thetford in Norfolk. So brain injury is invisible, but this white scarf follows us brain injured through this film. Three features of brain injury. Number one is that I can't think of two things at the same time. Always used to, all the time, can't now. Number two, for me, I can't visualize. I can't actually look somebody, look you straight in the face, shut my eyes and be able to see a picture see a picture of anything it's just black for me it's just black and the number th three thing is that I'm just living in the now I'm in the present nobody's explained this to me but I am here living in the present only in the present the first person on the film Stephen Wilkinson from Golden Bay in New Zealand he never knew he had a brain injury till he heard me on the radio so it's a bit interesting to see how he sees things. I was listening to the radio show and heard your interview and I was only peripherally listening, I was doing something and I heard you explaining the, what was happening in your life and how you were adapting to it and I thought it was like a light came and I thought, oh my god, this is what is happening to me. This is what's happened to me most of my life. And I thought, whoa. Okay, maybe this incident back when I was 19 has more effect on who I am now and how I do things now. Um, and until that interview, I had not ever considered that I had brain, a brain injury at all. I just got beat up in Sydney one day, that was it. Surgeons had taken my earring out to x-ray my head and... Um, I noticed my earring was gone, I asked the nurses where it was, and they said they took it out for x-rays, she didn't know where it was, so I got quite indignant about that, and we sort of huff, huff, tuffy puffied about it, and I said, oh, well, stuff this, I'm not going to be here, goodbye, and just got my clothes in, my flatmate and I left, and that was it, and um, I remember getting back to the flat, looking in the mirror for the first time, and I had this big, huge, round, yellow, greenish head, 
It's like perfectly round like a football. It's, just, it's pretty freaky, but... Bruised. Bruised, yes. And um, after then, I just moved on in my life. And it never became, you know, to me then as an issue. I was just a young guy going forward. I never thought or never saw that I had actually had a brain injury. Um, I had an accident in Sydney, but I never associated that incident with the way I deal with my day-to-day -day life and relationships or anything. I just saw that these things in my life that I adapted around were just part of my makeup, part of who I was. I didn't realize that I had a brain injury. But when I think about it, after listening to you on the, on the, the radio, that, that it's, it's quite important and it, and it does affect a large section of my life. And for these years, I never realized that's what, what that was. People, when they're looking at things, they can shut their eyes and they can see it. But for me, when I shut my eyes, I see nothing. I, I, it's, it's just black and it's just the color behind the eyelids, just random colors, no set colors for different thoughts. If I want to visualize something, I have to use words in my head. I have to actually say the words to make the image for me be real, but it's still not an image, it's just a group of words. And all my life, I feel like I'm living in a movie. This is a scene from a movie, when I drive off down the road, I'll be driving off down the road. I won't be reliving this or anything like that. Does that pick up with you? Do you feel that? Yes, yes. I don't see it as like I'm in a movie, but, but, but um, it's, to me, everything I see as, as things being compartmentalised. It's, it's I'm here, doing this, and then later on I'll be somewhere else doing something else and there'll be no thought about what's happened now. Same as no thought about what I'll be doing tomorrow in the, you know, uh, in the future. It, it's, it's just compartmentalised. If um, I, I, I'm with my partner, that's what I'm focused about and that's where I am. I say, if I can't remember this morning mm. or yesterday, I can't join up with now. I can remember now. Now yeah. it's happening. Yeah. But if I can't join that up with now, I can't use that connection to project into tomorrow. And so you need a statement I often make is you need a memory to have a future. How does that tune in with you? What do you think about that? Do you pick up on that? Um, well, not really, for, but only for the fact that I haven't put any thought into it. To me, there are just events. There are events that are going to come. A a and when they come, I can enjoy them. Like, I enjoy being in the Abel Tasman National Park. I enjoy rowing the boats, lying on the beach, interacting with my children. But I can't, before the event, visualize that and that happen. So, to me, it just doesn't exist until it happens. So, so in a way, the future is always um, unwritten, like everybody's future. But I can't start to draw the picture for the future, for the planning of it. The planning doesn't exist. It just. Can you hold two ideas in your mind at the same time? When I talk like that, do you, do you think connect? about something else? <laughs> no. no, no. You can only be here talking to me. Yes. So. I use my art to store my memory. If I do paintings or drawings, I can come back to them years later, look at them, and the, the emotions that I had while I was doing that work come back. What life skills have you taught yourself to handle since your accident? Um, one of the largest life skills I've, I've had to deal with or, or learn is, is acceptance. A, a, and because I didn't know how to deal with them, um, like remembering people's names or their faces. Um, I've just put it into as an acceptance. Well, okay, well, that's me. There's nothing bad or good about it, but it's just me. So, so rather than try and do memory skills to try and remember names, like people say, oh, you should you know, say the name 10 times or something, these things have never worked for me. And so I've gone, okay, well, I just have to accept that this is who I am. These are my pluses, these are my minuses, and to be happy with that. You can't accept something unless you know you've got some problem, some issue. 
for me that's that stuck out was the the names that was the main issue for me that was not being able to remember people and sometimes if I haven't met people enough remember their faces I mean I used to find it unnerving people would come up to me and talk to me like they knew me and I just go along with the conversation going well you obviously know me but I don't know who you are but I couldn't say that to them and I would just keep the conversation going hoping they would drop something that I could put a link to to then I could associate who they how they were connected to me but if they didn't and they walked away I would not know somebody was, somebody could say to me well who was that I go well, I don't know I've never seen them before in my life and that happened quite a few times it was um it was freaky it was very freaky yes yes also like I was living these two lives so if you're in your focus, yes. like you're working on something, example, and the telephone rings, mm. which is something completely different, mm. will that phone upset your focused action? If it's a, I'm focused on one issue, like say if I'm if I'm drawing or something, yes, yes, it, it, I will have an interruption, and, and it takes me a while just to get back into the to the thread of what I was doing. If when I'm doing something in a restaurant, I'm going from A to B and I get distracted and I, and, and I lose it, I get very frustrated with myself and, and I get angry at myself for not remembering it. Um, and, and when you came along on the radio, um, it was sort of like this light came on and it was like, good, this is it's, it's, it's a door that I can go through where maybe, because I've never looked into it in the past, that maybe there's skills, tools that I can use so I can have a more fulfilled life. I mean, in a way, I feel my life is fulfilled on, on many levels, but now that I look at it, there's a lot of failings that, that I shouldn't have to have in my life or, 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 or want in my life. How one is before the accident molds, creates the character that one arrives with after the accident. And the next person we uh, will see is Ali Chamberlain. And I bet she was always this compassionate, caring, deep thinking person who, um, who made the very best of her abilities. It's interesting which bit of care helps you grow and which bit of care turns you back into a victim. And that constant battle between are you a victim of something or are you an invalid or are you somebody who's growing in a different direction is quite difficult. Yes, everything, everything that you were was based on what you did and all that's been taken away from you or it feels like it's been taken away from you. So this tension between the people who are helping you get better and the people who are wanting you to be better than you were and other people saying but you're not well enough to do these sorts of things and you get well you get very angry <laughs> not, <laughs> to, to be quite polite about it um, because you, you the people who are helping you are doing it really well but then there's the other people, the insurers, who are wanting you to, to go back to work rather than getting back to life. And when you're recovering from a head injury, it's very difficult to be able to do both because the work of getting back to doing what you want to do is so time consuming and exhausting that you barely have time to be part of your family and, and keep up friendships and it's such hard work because your struggle is just to keep the daily stuff in your head let alone what anybody else's daily stuff is and I worry about talking about my brain injury often because I don't want it to sound as though I'm or the perception to be that I'm, I'm enjoying being not well because <laughs> bloody well not <laughs> um, but you so for your own benefit as well as for other people's benefit when you forget something or you make a silly mistake 
or you decorate a cake with the wrong coloured writing on it or something like that. You have to say, you know, if you do something, you say, well, before my head injury I wouldn't have done that. Or before my head injury I could remember 25 people's names in one sitting and still remember them. And, and now people I know read very well, I sometimes have great difficulty remembering their names. And people say, well, I forget people's names. But it's it's a it's a different thing because when I before I used to forget stuff and I'd go through my head thinking of it and there was an index there. And now when I go through stuff trying to find a name or something, it's just blank. There's no index there, there's no point of reference. I, I've given up wearing a pedometer because I knew the days that I had 18,000 steps in a day was a day I totally lost the plot because I had walked up and down that hallway so many times to get something and then forgetting what it was I'd gone for and then you'd go back again and then possibly and you'd still forget it. Sometimes you'd have to write it down on a piece of paper and take it with you. <laughs> what am I looking Oh, that's what I'm looking for. And the world doesn't see that and I'm sure that Jeff doesn't see it a lot of the time because that's what I do when there's no one around there's, and it just but it's getting better it's getting better every day it gets better it's just little triumphs Jeff is a real hero because he has been so good and so understanding um, and has managed to put humour into dire situations because nine years is a long time to live with someone who and still be nice to somebody <laughs> who keeps forgetting stuff all the time like you know, appointments or, or discussions that we've had or what you're going to have for dinner and ten minutes later you say now what are we going to have for dinner <laughs> and he doesn't walk up and go or, or call me a stupid idiot or anything like that. So he's been fabulous and everybody who has a head injury should have a Jeff. Many do. Yes, yeah. yes, they're very lucky. Yes, yes, you just need these little snippets of time when you can regroup and rebuild yourself and find out where you were and where you're going. <laughs> Oh dear, yes. So you can laugh now. I can. I used to do a lot of crying, yes. And I used to get very angry at what I'd lost. And, and I spent a lot of time in the early stages being angry about and worrying about what I couldn't do rather than thinking, well, this is what I can do and last week I couldn't do this. And this week I can, and it just keeps getting better. Making bread was a, just a lifesaver because it was a simple recipe. It had clear steps that had times attached to them, and it also had exercise, and it was dual exercise. So the kneading was very therapeutic, but you, and it fitted the way I my stamina at the time too so I could do the first bit of it and then have a sit down and then the next bit of it and have a sit down and then do that and then the reward when it was done a reward that you'd done something and you could see you'd done it and it was right it was just wonderful well I became Ali's celebration cakes because the initials are ACC and it was ACC who originally got me upright. They provided the, the, um, the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists and the people who encouraged me and helped me. Um, and cake making was about the only thing I could really do because I could do it in my own time, in my own space, and I could manage the amount of stuff I did and 
recipes are good because they're strict. Once I learned to use a recipe again, strict steps to take and timing. And, um, and then I started to decorate cakes. And I'd never decorated cakes before. Um, I used to cook a lot and entertain a lot, but I'd never decorated cakes. And so I had to teach myself to do it. And some of the early cakes are fairly dire. Um, but I have learned to do lots and lots of stuff. And I, but I do have to say to people, this is what we've discussed. This is about, you know, we'll get the shape right and we'll get the basic colours right but I will suddenly be moved by a spirit and a new, some new little thing will pop up on your cake that none of us have discussed because it just seems like the right thing to do. So that's, I guess, why every cake is different. I'm just trying to find a positive thing about praying. It's a bit of a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all alive. That's very positive. <laughs> um, and I've slowed down, which is really good. Um, yes, I do take more time to stop and smell the roses. The brain injury must have freed up my mind because I was never artistic. In fact, I, I think I probably failed art at school. Um, and now I can do things. I'm still not the greatest artist, but I've, I do the cake decorating. I've done a, a class in glass cast glass which was fabulous but it took a long time I was about a, a term behind everyone else while I got in with the, the techniques but I was yes I would even consider doing painting now which I thought I would never ever ever do the positive thing when you've got a brain injury is that you know it's going to get better that you will learn more things and you'll be surprised at what you learn and the care you will have for other people, I think, is quite interesting. That you're more, you're more aware of how other people are feeling and what they're doing because you're more aware of how you're doing things yourself. And the, the lovely little joys of the new things you learn is just, just fabulous, just keeps you going and every day will we'll get better and better. This is a film made up of artists and now we have a, a musician John Hansel Beadle lives on the North Shore in Auckland and he plays in the Gooka Music Carnival Band. Take it away, John. Swiss Carnival Band that I've been in for the last 20 odd years um, and they are it was started by Swiss people in New Zealand and based on the carnival bands in Europe and Switzerland which arise in each canton, each village has its own Gucke music band and they are designed to scare away winter and welcome in spring. So lots of big masks, lots of costumes, raucous music and at midnight on the day on, at the end of Ash Wednesday, or on Ash Wednesday, they stop. 
So they eat and drink and party and then just stop at midnight. Yeah, I mean, I've always been very musically inclined. I guess both my wife and myself are very much into music. We're a very musical family. But the difference for me with the head, with the aneurysm, the neurological condition, is that I felt a different sort of creativity. More painty, painting and that sort of creativity rather than the musical side. So fatigue is a huge issue and provided I manage my fatigue and rest up and do certain specific things, it kind of all ticks over, kind of. But it is very much one day at a time and I'm sitting here rather than working because of it. Because of the way it's left me and the effects that an employer sees, oh he's got to go off and meditate at lunchtime, oh I don't know about that. And noise affects me. Um, concentrating, sometimes I find it very difficult. I really, it's all of that together, stir it all around and does not leave me in a good space sometimes. However, being in denial as I have been for some time, I just carry on doing things anyway. Pretend it's not there, keep it at arm's length and just act as, be as normal as I possibly can. What do you actually mean by that? Uh, who wants to be brain damaged? I mean, people look funny. You say brain damage to the average person and, uh, and it's not like that. I'm not like that. But I'm neurologically challenged. And I, I often have to think, well, is it age or is it the con neurological condition or what? I used to go running a lot when I had my aneurysm. First thing I wanted to do was get up and go for a run again, so I did. I think those sorts of things are very important to maintain that sort of equilibrium, I guess. But as I said before, my intellect is fine. My the mechanical side of things, the cognition, the thinking things through, that's something else again, that's a little bit tricky. I think any sort of recovery depends on acceptance. Acceptance is the key, as someone that once told me. I think if you can accept that what is, is, and that's the way it is, nothing's going to change, then you can move on from that. And I have done that, I have accepted that this is the way it is. That I will be sitting at home on days like this, doing what I'm doing instead of being where I want to be, which is in a job working and earning lots of money and things. I just have to accept that's the way it is. And once you stop fighting and accept it, then it changes, I think. I, I, I compensate for my memory by forgetting things, by writing everything down. Endless lists, endless notes to myself, on the computer, everything's all my little system. Which looks incredibly neurotic, I think, to other people. My wife drives my wife spare sometimes because she's sick of me writing things all the time. But then I think, well, doesn't everybody do that? Doesn't everybody have to... This is the, the normalisation thing again. Doesn't have to, everybody have to write things down, keep a diary, have meticulous notes about everything? Maybe they don't. Maybe it is me. I don't know. But I just know that that's the only way I can manage it is to do certain things the way I've been taught. And so I do those things. I've got to say that my condition has changed over the years. I actually think it's improving. But how do I explain that to someone from the inside out? I sense that things that used to be a certain way are different now. It has made me very much aware of how important it is to be very real and honest and person to person rather than putting on masks and acting in certain ways. I pride myself on the fact that in spite of losing my job because of this condition, in spite of all other negative aspects of this condition, I have managed to put myself through a reasonably rigorous two and a half year program to get a qualification in the area in which I want to work, which is alcohol and drug and gambling studies. So I've, and I did that a lot to actually prove to myself and to other people that I can do it, and I did do it. I have made it all right. I worry about the future and I worry about it day to day at the moment, but by and large, I think it's okay. Well, she was beside me all the way, and still is. She puts up with me losing stuff all the time, she puts up with me doing all sorts of things that she shouldn't have to, but she does. And I really, really, really could not have made it without her. Generally, in terms of advice, you're not alone. Share the burden. Reach out to other people. Listen to what other people say. And just go off the flow of it, I guess. Keep it all simple and spontaneous and and then it works. It works if, if you work at it, as they say.
Robert Tarr is a man after my own heart and a bone and woodcarver and he lives just to the south of Whangarei in New Zealand and he is so enthusiastic and, and, and I came away absolutely brightened up and it was a complete treat to meet him. If you want to achieve anything with a brain injury, your focus has to be on your goal. If your goal is, is, is your art, which it is for me, then that is a, a, a beautifully simplistic goal. And it allows you to have room in your mind for your imagination. Uh, I guess the, uh, the, the thing for me with my carving is that if, if people enjoy my work, I, 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 I glean a little respect out of that. Uh, and that's very important to me because I was in a, in a job previous to my accident that I had a lot of respect. Uh, and that was something I'd lived with for a long time. And to lose that psychologically was, was, was a, a, a real imposition, if you like. Uh, to find people that uh, enjoy my work uh, gives me heart. A brain, in a brain injury is very complex. Uh, as you experience more and more fatigue uh, through cognitive drain, uh, the edges get a lot sharper and, and, they, and they inflict more, more, more wounds perhaps. Uh, and that is, is, is what can be debilitating. I think, I think probably the piece of work behind me here is, is, is a simple piece of work and where a brain injury can be a quite a co complicated lifestyle, uh, I definitely revert to the simple things and I find there that, that, that simplicity is the most beautiful and I love creating that from a stationary piece. Uh, and I think that piece really has got that, that potential movement in it. It's not finished yet. It's not. It doesn't have a lot of pieces in it. It doesn't have a lot of individual pieces in it. Uh, but it flows and it's soft and it's, it's warm and, it's, and it doesn't have harsh, jagged edges, really. And, and I like that. It, it suits me. I... I absolutely love finding new th ways to do things. Sometimes it's through necessity to find an easier way to do things. I get frustrated when something doesn't work and I like making making the uh, making the edges fit. I tried first off from a drawing to, to cut two pieces and they never fitted together. Never. It was impossible. So I, I devised a way of making it more of a perfect fit, a snugger fit. And I'm always challenging myself to find new ways of doing things that are a little more perfect perhaps. Really I use I use I use the passion that I had before, but I've I've channeled it more narrowly uh, yeah to to give me the ability to come to my goal. Uh, now I've needed to do that and that's been a very difficult thing for me because I, I believed I had the ability to multitask before and now I don't. And I've got to accept that or crash and burn. Uh, it was a, a gift for a relation that gave me some beautiful wood and uh, I knew what I wanted to make. And I could visualize it in my head, uh, but when I started building it, it seemed like I had I was under some kind of small possession, if you like, which was which I which was a feeling that I ran with because I thought it was right. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a a, a a religious person overly, but I liked the feeling, and I let my hands do the work. It's a piece. I wanted to do something that was a little bit Māori, uh, a little bit European, uh, because I have both of those sides in my family, uh, and I think I uh, achieved it. Having a place where you can go, where you can create things that give you the enjoyment of uh, your work and respect is imperative, 
because not only are you uh, are you uh, taking a holiday from your family and friends, as your family and friends are also taking a holiday from you, which is again constructive. I've always thought outside the square and I've always tried to do more than I'm what I think I'm capable of uh, and to have that challenge uh, in your mind is healthy I think because it stops you from going backwards. Well the butterfly was uh, something that I had immense pleasure in making because its simplicity was its beauty. The wood is swamp cowrie it was bought by a friend of mine as rough wood and he milled it and I got the off cuts. My wife actually went and collected them in the trailer to save them being burnt because I wasn't here. <laughs> I know how I would want those. I'm there. It was a deer antler in the bone and a, uh, a terrari body of the actual butterfly with power on its wings with power as a New Zealand shellfish uh, and it just came together so beautifully and it was it was like that picture and and and, and somebody meant me to do it uh, it was like a, an influence it was it was something that came from my heart and uh, and it turned out just like I had imagined it and I hope people like it go okay, I found this in uh, some topsoil that I bought from Ruakaka, it's swamp cowrie and it's the tip out of a, of a cowrie tree as it goes to the end of the actual tree high up. Uh, I wire brushed it off and sealed it with a, uh, a polyurethane wash and I just love it. It's, it's got character, it's got movement, it's got texture and it's, it's hard and it's hundreds of years old and it's it's a beautiful thing and I want to uh, keep the tip going whereas this is broken with bone and keep the same character of the small branches as a small tree as it was. It's a piece of totra batten again uh, and I just thought I'd create a little fireplace. I've known her since she was on the first head-on film and she lives in Whangarei in New Zealand and like so many of us she wants to communicate to other people to our brain injured friends and to the medicos just what it's like living inside this extraordinary brain state and she's gone to the length of writing a book so we'll hear some of that in our meeting Structure means that I've got control of my life. It's really important to have your own control because it means you're not dependent on somebody else telling you how or what or when and why and who and you've got the choice of being able to decide all that for yourself. and. You're not quite independent, but you're verging on it. But when, when you're living with someone, in the sense of my darling hubby, I'm, inter I'm interdependent on him in the sense of he relies on me for a lot of stuff, which is real buzz, but I also rely on him for a lot of stuff. He's got his little bit of independence, I've got my little independence, and we coexist or something. And it's actually quite go with the flow smoothly. Sometimes it gets a bit rough, but that's when I'm tired. And I know when I'm tired is I have very, very, very low patience. Um, and my reactions aren't very nice. Here's a story. The other day, waiting for you, you didn't arrive, the phone went. 
I'm in the middle of making bread. It's like, do I answer it? Don't I? I answered it. It was your friend, really good friend Dennis. Got led astray. I loved talking to him. He was so interesting. Talking, talking, hung up. Came back to the bench and went into a panic. It was like, oh, where am I up to? And then it was like, well, look to the left. There's all the ingredients you've already put in. There's the ones you've got left. That's where you're up to. Calm down. William's safe. You're safe. It's okay. So I finished off the bread. And was the bread awesome? The bread was bloody awesome. It was awesome. So, you know, it's like everyday routine things you have you, you actually don't remember that you've been taught strategies of dealing with recipes and how to deal with phone calls coming in and life life if you're working with physios and OTs and neuropsychs and listen to them even though they don't understand, they're there for you, they can tell you all these different things to do to cope on a daily livable basis, might not be anything like your old life, your past life, it might not be anything like your past life, but that'll start dribbling through because you might be learning new strategies to cope with your new life and then eventually some of your old abilities will come through and build on your learning and it'll be a relearning and they'll meld together and so you'll develop a new person but based on an old kind of person but not yeah and um, you'll still be there but it'll just be a different way of working or a different way of seeing a different way of dealing with things a different way to cope um, you'll learn so many things that you can take on board or you can't you, you don't have to take it on board but a lot of the strategies that you're taught are really important because they work and you've got to work really hard to get them to be a habit you've got to work really hard to learn them you have to go with that flow for the first five odd years to actually get it buried in your new learning so that it does become a habit so that you don't actually realise you forget or yeah so when you begin to look good people prefer to think that you are back to your usual self back to Normal and fully recovered. Normalcy, normality, normalize. Basically, these words mean to bring into conformity with the standard. People think I'm back to normal. My face and body are sort of symmetrical, and I've got good coordination and balance back again. I can give relevant responses, enunciate it clearly. It is only me that knows that I'm not all there anymore. Inside my brain, I scramble to keep up. I try to say the right things to sound normal and to appear natural. As a survivor from injuries to my brain, I will be on a journey of recovery for the rest of my life. Some of my tastes have changed in some of the ways I do things, but I am still lucky enough 
to have a mind of my own. As long as I can keep thinking, I know that I am still alive to be. Keep thinking, keep being. Come on guys, it's really important. Go with the flow.